right, now you've met us, so we're going to hand straight over to the lensing offices. So, Tricia, say hello. so much um, we'll put the names and companies on the YouTube information so that you can check that out because I can hear you and I can see you but probably I'm very old I did catch all the, the uh, job titles so I'm sure that'll be really useful now we're gonna go on to the first part of our updates as I told you we have this amazing knowledge hub thanks to circular economy who host it so we really want year on year to, to have this grow. I mean, if you're in academia, this is a gift because it's like somebody else doing your literature review for you. Uh, but if you're a business doing R&D, it's also a gift because this is what's happening, what's progressing every year. And what we do is we go and find go global mappers. Um, and this year, we've had an exceptional group. So can we please have the film about global um, mapping project? Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Andrea and I have been coordinating the Global Mapping Project alongside Freya for the past two months. First of all, what is the Global Mapping Project and why is it needed? In order to chart how to get to 100% circularity by 2050, we need to start with an understanding of where we stand today. Right now, information on this front is often missing, siloed or incomplete, so we need to find out what circular activity is currently happening in the textiles and apparel industry and where in the world it is happening. This is why WCTD teamed up with Circle Economy's Knowledge Hub to launch the world's largest digital library of circular textiles case studies, the WCTD collection. The data collected on the Knowledge Hub will be used to lay the foundation for the roadmap to 2050. How is the data in the WCTD collection organized? The WCTD collection has case studies, which can take the form of a business case, a policy case, or a report or article. The case studies are written by contributors who research, create, and upload case studies and are edited by curators who ensure their high quality. Two months ago, we launched the Global Call for Volunteers for the second edition of the Global Mapping Project. And we gathered 47 volunteers. We had the help of six BA students, 12 MA students, six PhD students, and 23 early career researchers. The volunteers came from 28 different countries, from the Americas to Africa, from Europe to Asia and Australia. We had on our team engineers, designers, architects, specialists in circular economy, environmental economics and policy, as well as recycling startup owners, urban water and sustainable resource managers and sustainability environmentalists. Up until this day, we have over 700 global case studies mapped on the Knowledge Hub and over 400 cases in the WCTD collection. You can get involved by reading about the current state of circular activity globally on the Knowledge Hub, as well as you can add your case study to the WCTD collection and get in touch by joining the global mapping team. Now we'll hand over to Luisa, Mara and Lucia, three of our volunteers, to talk about some of the case studies they contributed with to the global mapping project. 
Hi everyone, my name is Louisa and I'll be sharing my case study called Using Biotechnology to Create Lab-Grown Cotton. This is a company's case study on Galley, who are a biomaterials research company and they're based in Sao Paulo, South America, but they also have offices in Boston in the United States. The key elements of the circular economy this case study relates to are alternative bio-based materials and material efficiency and minimal waste and resource efficiency. So what do they do? Galley take cotton stem cells and they grow them in a laboratory environment. This means that they can control conditions that cotton would otherwise be subject to in a field. So things like weather, soil conditions and sunlight. And by controlling these conditions, they've estimated that they can grow cotton 10 times faster with 78% less water, 81% less land and no pesticides. In the textile industry, most of the ecological harm caused by textile processing happens at the finishing and the dyeing stage. Paper Futures started in 2011. They worked on the growth of the organism Streptomyces CD color directly onto silk. This process generates very little runoff and produces a color fast pigment without the use of any chemicals. Their journey with bacteria dyes have been explored through a series of research experiments for exhibitions. To scale the method of making so it can be used in the industry, they use the bioreactor, which contains a type of microorganism connected to a suite of automated hardware and software, which gives feedback on the growth conditions of the microbe, developing new methods and technologies on the industrial scale. Hello, I'm Lucia Lopez. I'm a fashion designer and lecturer at Universidad de la República in Uruguay, and I'm presenting the case of Upmade, that is a design method and manufacturing certification for upcycling on an industrial scale. Upmade was created by the Estonian designer Red House, and this method allows using a software system to use a textile waste of fashion brands and factories to create new garments. In this way, the textile waste is avoided, uh, material costs are reduced, and the environment impact of the garments produced is minimized, saving an average of 91% water and 85% CO2 emissions. The companies um, that implement this software can also request the APMA certification if they meet the requirements, of course, and this certification is valid for three years in which at least one uh, random audit of the factory is conducted. Well, I would like to uh, call attention as someone who's kind of overseen this group of volunteers the past year on just how much um, uptake and interest we have seen in this kind of mapping. I mean, this has only been running now for two years. Each year we put out a global call for volunteers and we were inundated with interest this year. And it is really not to be underestimated how exceptional it is that we have 47 over 28 countries. So these are like eyes and ears on the ground trying to constantly pinpoint what are the latest developments in their particular regions. So it is really, uh, it's an exceptional kind of time capsule that is going to grow year on year and hopefully in a live way capture how this field is evolving. Then what we do as co-founders and with our research teams is we look at what is being captured each year and we try to make sense of it. So what are the kind of key trends and developments that we're seeing? What are the areas where we're seeing clusters of activities versus where are there gaps emerging and why might that be? And this is what we're going to share with you now, kind of our key insights on the three WCTD themes. So for those of you who aren't so familiar, there are three core themes that we work with in World Circular Textiles Day. The first is uh, materials, the second is products and services, and the third is people. So we've been looking at these three themes and I'll share with you now the first, which is around products and services. welcome. The WCTT vision imagines an industry where products and services are designed for multiple use and material value retention with maximum positive impact. 
I'm Freya Gardner, coordinator of the 2022 Global Mapping Project, and together with Gwen Cunningham, WCTD co-founder, I'll be taking a look at how the field of circular products and business models has developed in the past year. 2022 has seen circular design become an increasingly important approach in the fashion and textile space. It is widely agreed that extending the life of products is the most efficient way to reduce the impact on climate and the environment. But to achieve this design, or in many cases redesign, needs to take a central role. This is because decisions made during design and manufacturing, including material choices and production processes, hugely influence that product's life cycle positively or negatively from how it's used to its options at end of use. Brands are increasingly recognizing their responsibility and with it a desire to go beyond sustainability. They are seeking concrete guidance on designing for circularity by considering materials, design strategies and recycling requirements. In other words, how to take theoretical concepts and turn them into actionable, scalable and holistic design solutions that care for a product's entire life cycle. So to bridge the gap and provide the building blocks for industry to follow, there is significant interest in the development and adoption of circular design guidelines and criteria by designers, fashion brands and retailers. Circular design frameworks have been introduced in 2022 by Zalando, Bessela, Ghani, and Hugo Boss, among others. Several take inspiration from the design principles defined by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where products are made from safe and recycled or renewable inputs, made to be used more and made to be made again. The goals and purpose of these circularity frameworks are multifold. They are intended to steer product design and to inspire positive and innovative approaches. They are also a way to measure progress towards targets and to validate and claim products as circular. By following them, brands can also ensure they comply with regulations, both current and upcoming, as well as scale their impact, influence market dynamics and spread circularity. The topic of compliance is especially relevant because of the release of the EU strategy for sustainable and circular textiles earlier this year. It includes mandatory eco-design requirements for aspects that include durability, reusability, repairability and fibre to fibre recyclability, which we hope will guide the way to much needed industry-wide definitions and standardisation. Additionally, the Eco-Design for Sustainable Products Regulation introduces digital product passports, coupled with information requirements on circularity and other environmental aspects. It recognises the need for clear, accessible and reliable product-related information that can empower companies and consumers to make informed decisions and improve communication across the supply chain by tracking aspects like fibre composition and substances of concern. Storing and sharing such data also boosts the visibility and the credibility of brands and their products. This value is increasingly being acknowledged, which is in turn creating more demand for solution providers. For example, this year saw the adoption of the Circularity ID by the brands Otto, Slow Label and Retainer, as well as a commitment by Mulberry to add Eon powered digital IDs to all of their products by 2025. Alongside this, the EU strategy includes green claims for truly sustainable textiles, which requires environmental claims such as green and conscious to be underpinned not only by evidence, but recognised excellence in performance. Information must also be specific, accurate and unambiguous, so not to mislead consumers. Otherwise, a practice called greenwashing can and does occur. In fact, the last few months have seen a surge in the number of investigations, lawsuits and fines against brands for misleading sustainability claims, including H&M, Decathlon, ASOS, Boohoo and Asta. So the need for change in daily operations is clear. And so I hand over to Gwen to discuss developments and trends in circular business models. Thank you, Freya. Circular design needs to go hand in hand with circular business models. I've been looking at the 104 new cases from the WCTD Knowledge Hub and speaking to signatories to try and understand how this space has really evolved in the last 12 months. Now, this time last year, we were reporting on the fact that resale and rental was really booming. Now we're seeing that this is continuing, but it's also spreading across new markets. So more and more, value market and luxury market players are dipping their toe in the resale space in particular. And that's really pushing this more and more into the cultural mainstream. And we've seen some kind of notable examples of this. So in the value market space, 
We had H&M, for instance, launching their integrated um, platform for secondhand resale. We saw uh, Primark during the year uh, partnering with Warnwell uh, to introduce uh, vintage clothing and concessions in a few of their stores. And of course, we saw eBay really taking that coveted role as brand partner to Love Island and usurping kind of the traditional fast fashion partnerships that you might usually see in that space. And then, of course, we have luxury kind of embracing resale, I think, with a new um, with a new energy. And really, a lot of the developments we've seen here have been around this idea of the archive. So we had Jean-Paul Gaultier's vintage resale. Uh, we had Valentino's take back. We had the Gucci vault, the Bottega um, um, series where archival pieces are being resold at their original price. And I think these definitely have a sustainability drive, but they're also very practically a result of the regulation that we saw come through at the beginning of the year in France that now deems that we can no longer destroy unsold stock. And so many of these luxury players especially are coming up with creative ways to bring new life to old creations and to develop new ventures that make use of that dormant stock that they do have. The second big development here has been in the alignment that we've seen between digital garment technology providers and the industry as a whole when it comes to the digital passport. And the big win in this space has been the, uh, the launch of the circular product data protocol that happened during the year. And this was a huge undertaking um, over a number of months um, and in collaboration with partners from academia, policy industry through the Circular ID initiative. And it is a global identification system that aims to ensure that essential product and material data is going to be communicated in a consistent way across the industry and a consistent way across these new technologies and innovations that are emerging. Finally, then, we are seeing that repair is really taking the spotlight, getting the recognition it deserves as a strategy in and of itself to extend the lifetime of products, but also as an enabler of these post-use strategies like resale. And the Renewal Workshop reported that of all the products that come back through a take-back scheme, brands generally will be able to resell about 46% of those. But if you add a repair intervention, that number goes from 46 to 82. So this is really crucial part of the puzzle. And of course, the Renewal Workshop themselves were acquired during the year by Blackman, the um, supply chain uh, management services company that now aim to roll out renewal and e-commerce services to all of its global clients. That in and of itself, probably a pretty good indicator of the kind of rising star uh, that repair is in this space. But the solutions that we're seeing evolving here are largely kind of B2C, interestingly, and also quite tech enabled. So the United Repair Centre launched in July of this year, collaborations between Patagonia and um, Makers Unite and with the support of the Amsterdam Economic Board, amongst others. And this is really an initiative that um, really keeps materials and people functioning at their highest potential. It is repairing products on behalf of a brand, but it's also reskilling and employing people who have a distance from the labor market. And then Sojo, you know, using technology to connect a existing supply in terms of seamstresses, technicians, repair specialists with an emerging demand. And many, many examples similar to Sojo emerging all across the world, um, many of them in, in South America actually, and using less advanced technologies, but sometimes even utilizing just existing social media platforms, for instance, to really connect and play the go-between between, between um, the customer and these repair specialists. So many developments still, of course, many challenges and many things to improve, some of which you see here. I hope in the coming year we see greater alignment, coordination and collaboration in the development and rollout of circular design guidelines and criteria. I hope we are developing metrics 
to quantify, track and validate the true social and environmental impact of all of these new business models. And personally, I hope that we also start to bridge the gap between all of these disparate kind of elements and imagine and model what would this holistic circular system look like? How can materials flow between partners and how can value, importantly, flow between partners in an equitable way? Thank you so much. a surreal thing isn't it like Very we've got surreal. new york over there we're london here we've got an online audience we've got gwen on screen uh, yeah slight strange but it's kind of how we're using technology now and actually the thread through all of that content was the way in which technology is making circularity more feasible um cindy you've you've got an interest in in the in the digital tagging being useful well, yeah, I think what struck me most about what Freya and Gwen were saying, they were mentioning different components of circularity, like designing for circularity, repair services, legislation, digital passport, all components of circularity, which, I mean, we said at the launch of WCTD in 2020 that there were three phases of circularity. Phase one is now, between NAP 2020 and 2025 where it's really about uh, piloting the system. All of these R&D pieces coming together to bring this system that we talk about uh, together. And then 2025 to 2040 is where we implement these, these developed systems and they start forming into more circular textile hubs geographically, really tracking and mapping flows of materials uh, and products and then finally 2040 to 2050 as we work towards full circularity is when we optimize that system and i think the digital passport concept i mean this is a crazy idea it, to think that we're going to put ids and all that information on every product it seemed very pie in the sky a couple years ago and now we're hearing it being implemented and yes they're pilots and yes they're small scale but they're real now the legislation is changing and all of things all of these things are moving to standardization and i think for me from a products uh, and services perspective that's been the most exciting development over the past year Brilliant. Thank you, Cindy. Yes, I agree. And the step before that, of course, uh, in a way, is, is the materials. So we've got our products. They're coming through. What are they made of? How are they being reprocessed? The next film we've got to share with you is by Professor Kate Goldsworthy, and she's giving us an update on what's been happening in the materials space this year. So, what's been happening in the materials space this year? It's hard to imagine how we could improve on the incredible progress made last year, but I think if anything, we found evidence that we're progressing even faster. This year, we commissioned an in-depth piece of research to add to our signatory updates and uncover as many innovations as possible with over 200 case studies. My job in the next few minutes is to try and set out where the progress is being made, by whom and what next. And again, we asked of you, what have been your biggest accomplishments this year? What are your biggest challenges? And what's the one thing you need from others to succeed? So let's look at some of this year's big successes in three key areas, new circular fiber developments, dyeing finishing and manufacturing processes, and fiber to fiber recycling technology. It's impossible to cover it all in just a few minutes, but they will all be featured on the World Circular Textiles Day Knowledge Hub, so they'll be available online to everyone. There have been some huge steps forward in the fibre development space, not only through recycled fibres coming to market or scaling up, but also linking waste streams from agriculture and other industries to create new fibres and yarns. So let's focus on the commercialisation of Lensing's Refibra, more brands are using the fibre, including Timberland, Calvin Klein, Gap, Everlane, H&M, to mention a few. And importantly, the list of brands cover a broad range of price points. And this year, they also introduced limited edition innovations with agricultural waste, including orange and hemp. 
In yarn development, we saw 100% recycled content yarns at scale from Usher Yarns and very high percentage blends of post-consumer waste content from others, including Geet and Gel Woolens. Anana Sanam are launching a new bio-based yarn this year with impact analysis built into their R&D process from the start. And Fashion for Good launched their untapped agricultural waste project to validate and scale technologies that can successfully transform farming waste into sustainable textile fibres. All of these developments represent a real step change in the industry, with bio-based and circular fibres being the focus for all. It's heartening to know that this year's Heim Textile in Frankfurt, one of the largest textile fairs in Europe, is focusing completely on circularity and sustainability in their showcases next year. Much of the progress being made in the vast array of processing that happens between the fibre and its ultimate recovery is in developing more sustainable ways of producing and finishing our textiles, a not inconsiderable task. However, Circularity is a vital consideration here too. This is where so much circularity can be blocked or ideally programmed in at the start. 2022 saw innovation across all parts of this textile supply chain, not least in the dyeing industry. Fashion for Good launched Dry Factory of the Future, a new consortium project to accelerate the shift from wet to mostly dry processing and working to bring plant-based indigo to scale through their Future of Denim Dyeing collaboration. For their 2022 Global Innovation Programme, they included some brilliant dye innovators, including Dye Recycle and EverDye. In the UK, we saw the creation of the first ever sustainable denim laundry built by Black Horse Lane Ateliers at their London headquarters. And companies like Caracol are developing an innovative process for dyeing wool yarn by using natural colorants which are active ingredients extracted from waste fruit skins and vegetable peel left over from the juicing industry. And here we shouldn't forget innovation in our oldest industrial processes too, that are being revitalized and brought up to date for a cleaner industry. William Clark and Sons are the last commercial beetlers in the world, an historic mechanical process involving the pounding of linen to develop a beautiful character sheen. They're currently exploring sustainable finishes that will add stain resistant properties to their beetled linen, bringing their technology up to date in the process. And we should celebrate some of the incredible creativity of designers working in this space on reusing and remanufacturing textile waste in ever more scalable ways. Reweave, a new textile R&D lab currently working with UAL's Fashion Textiles and Technology Institute, is focused on the development of highly crafted recycled textiles made from industry waste fabric, which are market relevant at a range of price points. Unsurprisingly, we have seen a huge amount of effort and progress in the area of textile recycling, not least in the chemical recovery space, with Warn Again building their new demo plant in Switzerland to showcase its groundbreaking textile recycling technology for polyester and cellulose, has the capacity to prevent a thousand tons of textiles being incinerated every year and paves the way for industrial scale operations. And Lensing, in partnership with Sodra, jointly speeding up the process of post-consumer recycling of cellulose rich waste and enlarging their industrial scale line to produce up to 25,000 tons of post-consumer textile waste by 2025. And we really should also highlight the amazing progress being made in the mechanical recycling industry too. Recover have just opened their first facility in Bangladesh and will open a second hub in Dhaka this year. They're also working with Artisan Denim Mills, Mills their partner in Pakistan, to scale the use of recycled cotton from post-consumer denim. Project Plan B have used their mechanical extrusion technology to successfully spin yarns from post-consumer polyester and in the process made buttons of the lower grade RPET pellets. And Inuyo recently installed the UK's only textile recycling machinery suitable for wool and cashmere, including textiles on site at Chimera in Huddersfield. This machine recycles both pre and post-consumer textile waste and garments. And since setting up in August, they've saved three and a half thousand kilos of waste and are currently working on a new range of recycled yarns in order to save even more. All this exactly 20 years after the last shoddy mill closed in the UK.
Now is the time to match this scaling up of recycling capacity with feedstock supply, and we're seeing tangible, tangible progress in this area too. ICO has scaled up their automated sorting for recycling tech that allows a highly precise sorting process by colour and material, which is crucial to recycle high quality fabrics from old textiles. Recovo have recovered and sold more than 275,000 metres of textiles with potential CO2 savings of 150 tonnes. And reverse resources bring focus on traceability in the textile value chain, making the waste visible and accessible to recyclers. Since our last World Circular Textiles Day, they have had more than 8 million kilos of textile waste registered on their platform, with over 100 new factories actively registering and segregating waste, the tip of a very large iceberg that I'm excited to see grow during 2023. So I really have no doubt that we've made huge progress based on the challenges we identified last year, more technology scaling up, more take up of high quality recycled materials, more circularity designed in at the start and joining up of circular stakeholders, and ultimately more waste textiles saved from landfill. But there's a lot more to do. And based on what you told us, this is our list of focus for 2023. We need investment in the equipment, services and infrastructure required to facilitate take back and recycling at scale. We need new innovations to overcome the current global challenges, so in tension with our circularity goals. We need removal of residual chemicals in the feedstock, especially with post-consumer raw materials, and alignment on how to standardise and report on the growing number of circularity initiatives. We need more primary and dynamic data available along the value chain to constantly check our actions against results. And as many textile brands as possible need to design for recyclability, so we have the feedstock necessary to scale. And of course, continuing a collaborative risk sharing approach is the way that we'll really make progress in the fastest way possible. <laughs> and um, and there's more too. I mean, there's quite a lot that Kate you couldn't even fit in there that we should mention from this year. Definitely, I think there's so much happening. It's hard to keep up, but a couple to name check here. We have Evernew in the U.S. with their cotton recycling. Uh, Renew Cell has been leading the way in Sweden with its first commercial scale textile to textile recycling plant. Infinited Fiber and all the deals they're doing with brands, offtake agreements, um, Infina being um, collaborating with brands, getting that fiber into their garments. And we're going to hear as well from Cirque in a bit on one of their updates from the US. And maybe just to add to that, because I think what I loved about Kate's report is also her call for these two things in parallel, that we have to have the scale-up of the technology, but we also have to have the scale-up of the pre-processing and the actual feedstock for the technology. And one thing that maybe it was it's so recent that it's not in the report, but um, just last week, um, Circle Economy and uh, Fashion for Good launched a report called Sorting for Circularity on a big piece of research that's been happening all across Europe for the past 18 months, looking at this question of feedstock do we have the actual supply of materials to fuel this scale up in recycling and what was really interesting from that report was it showed that about 74 percent of all the low value textiles in europe are suitable for suitable and available for high value textile to textile recycling and th this was through a big piece of uh, really on the ground research that happened across six countries in europe over 18 months so 74% is really high, it's really encouraging for sure. It also calls to mind then of course that there's 26% that is not suitable for high value textile to textile recycling. So there is no circular solutions for that fraction because they are you know, too many blends, because they have too many contaminants on them or disruptors that can't be removed or often because they're made from multiple types of material. So again, the call to action to designers to change the way that they design. But this is, you know, these two things happening hand in hand very much at the moment. Great. 
One more point on that. Well, and as a chemical recycler, that is one of the key integral missing pieces is the sorting for different types of recycling, whether it's mechanical or chemical. Um, and I think another observation on materials that I wanted to mention was that while we're really starting to see more investment in technologies, in innovation, the scale of the finance that's needed um, to replicate these technologies and these processes really has a long way to go to meet um, what's actually needed. I mean, it's huge infrastructure and multiple plants around the world. So a long way to go on that, but I think there's a couple of promising signs on the finance side. Uh, closed loop partners in the US recently announced their leadership fund in excess of $200 million, with some of that funding going towards circular supply chain businesses in the apparel industry. And then Apparel Impact Institute also launched the Fashion Climate Fund for to the tune of $250 million with a mission of decarbonizing textile supply chains by 2040. And I think if we look at this relatively small amount of finance um, that's coming forward right now, actually look at that as unlocking the billions that's going to be needed. I think the changing landscape here is really something to celebrate. It's really shifting, and this is just over the last year. Thank you, Cindy. The phone calls we've had with different people during the years absolutely blow my mind. You know, I had no idea of the scales and the volumes that we were talking about. I've just been so involved in the sort of textiles um, research. So this, this sense of scale now, I think sorting is the new black. We haven't talked about it enough. It's so important. Those feedstocks going through are crucial. Nothing's going to get built unless you can prove the, the sort of feedstock f um, flow. So thinking big, absolutely. And investment is something we're going to talk about in the next section as well. So moving on now to the third theme, um, which is um, people and society. We don't want this to be a movement that's just about businesses and technology. This has got to be better for people too. So what does it look like this year? Welcome to this 2022 update on the people and society theme. My name is Professor Becky Early. This time last year, we had identified some key areas that needed development. We could see that designers and entrepreneurs were working well with this area, but there needed to be some scale. We uh, identified that national and international leadership and leadership style was very much needed for these themes. And we also identified that individuals were really interested, but there was a great deal of confusion in this sector and that better communication was needed. So this year, we're building on the case studies that are uh, have been uploaded to the Knowledge Hub and the themes of policy industry and education that are there and we're also including some notes about investment equity partnerships and communication so in terms of policy achieve it within broad strategies brands need to be held accountable for their practices the new york fashion sustainability and social accountability act passed in january 2022 goes a step towards forcing companies to prioritize environmental and social sustainability on the 30th of march 2022 the eu commission adopted a strategy for sustainable and circular textiles this will introduce the eco design requirements a digital product passport discourage fast fashion, harmonize extended producer responsibility rules, and address the unintentional release of microplastics in the environment. It's a great first step to driving change through regulation. We've also seen investment opportunities open up this year. The European Investment Bank and the Social Innovation Tournament uh, shortlisted circular textile companies uh, for the fund, including Resortex. 
some companies are getting ahead of the legislation and changing their practices even before they're forced to. Very recently, the founder of Patagonia, Ivan Schunard, made headlines for signing over his $3 billion worth business to a specially designed trust and a um, non-profit organization tasked to help fight climate change rather than selling it or making it public. Brands are the front runners of a transition to circularity, working inside their teams and with each other to challenge the linear model. BSR is a business network and a consultancy which has report, published a report including recommendations for business to make the people in the supply chain the focus of a shift to circularity. The future of circularity is also in the hands of micro and small businesses setting the example. The Denim to Denim project aims to shift the circular textiles narrative away from the exclusive arenas of big corporations and instead explores it through the lens of those who are implementing circular practices on the ground. In this case, tailors, menders and upcyclists in Kenya. A social impact project started in Prato, Italy in March 22, turned a critical situation into an opportunity. With the Ney Nostri Pani project, five people in a vulnerable situation started a six month programme in five local Prato based companies. Here, circularity is what links together the preservation of the old traditions and created an opportunity for social development and protection for vulnerable people. This year, we partnered with a Parsons MA student, Alexa Rocanova, to explore the key barriers and intervention points for implementing a circular textile system in Leicester. While circularity enables initiatives and infrastructures were identified, systemic and simultaneous strategies are needed for actual impl implementation of circular solutions. So it was really a scoping report to look at the potential for Leicester to um, transition from maybe a fast fashion production centre to a UK centre for circular fashion. Uh, some insights from this will be um, shared later uh, this year. Looking at education now, in Scotland, the new college in Lanarkshire has developed a programme for vocational courses to focus on circular economy in warehousing, packaging and caring for garments. In, partner, in partnership with company Advanced Clothing Solutions. Still in Scotland, even the little ones are getting introduced to circular practices with Ostrero free touring workshops focused on creative ways of making fashion circular. And this time last year, we introduced you to the TCBL network and the She Makes project. And the update this year is that many workshops across Europe have um, taken place looking at gender visions and gender equity again, bringing textile design um, females into safe spaces to use new workshop tools to share their experiences and um, to brainstorm uh, new, new solutions. And now in partnerships, um, a circular hero this year, uh, Bank and Vogue, have partnered with Converse. So as the pressure for retailers to adopt more circular practices increases, 2022 has seen even more companies and governments set goals to become carbon neutral in the years to come. BVH Services is Bank and Vogue's innovative sister company with a mission of reducing waste and pioneering sustainable solutions for the fashion industry. So this project was really exciting because Beyond Retro sorted and then graded stripy shirts and then worked with Converse to develop the upper for this classic summer shoe. Um, also in partnerships in World Circular Textiles Day, we've been doing some signatory mapping. And this mini project funded by Centre for Circular Design uh, was conducted by Katie Shand. And she talked to different stakeholders about what kinds of circular actions they're taking this year. And we're really trying to identify why there is such a gap in um, sort of the people and society section. What can we do? How can we bridge those gaps and create more opportunities?
So she conducted 18 interviews with the Signatory Network. But crucially, we developed 73 criteria into eight um, sort of themes or elements of circularity. And then we were able to see who was doing what and, and where the real opportunities were and where there are experts and where that knowledge might get bridged across um, to other partners. So that was really exciting. Uh, but really, we all need to learn a lot more about how we can transition collectively uh, in our everyday lives. And for that, the Pais Circular News Outlet in Chile improves the information um, and dissemination of climate action and responsible citizenship. It's a really good model and I'd love to see more um, actions like this from the media. And one of our other circular heroes, the Conduits, they've really facilitated us this year as an organisation, World Circular Textiles Day, to you know, grow our network, to host meetings, stakeholders, expanding the conversation, publicising the work that we're doing. Um, and we really need many more opportunities like this to, to raise the volume on the work that's going on. So these are the themes um, from this year, and please take a look at them. Have a think about where you can bring value. Have a think about what you're doing that's original and impactful. Um, continue to tell us about it. Upload your good work to the Knowledge Hub, and I look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Good, we should get her next <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so also today then, so what's really exciting is that some of the stakeholders are kind of uh, having events at the same time and linking up and I just want to sort of highlight RAP, uh, RAP's report that went live today which is a citizens insight report, a really important step forward on the roadmap work that they've been doing. So they brought out, I know you know this, but Textiles 2030 came out last year as a report and also a roadmap and they're now taking these steps forward and doing this original research. What's so important is understanding more about people's behaviour because they are such a big part of any circular system. Um, any thoughts? Well, I would even go bigger still. I think just linking people to the circular economy in, in and of itself is such an important endeavor right now because I think traditionally the concept has been seen as, you know, primarily to do with resource efficiency and the kind of link between the environmental benefits of transitioning and the social benefits of transitioning is something that we're only kind of starting to really get a handle on now. Um, so it, really we have to remember that, you know, making this move from linear to circular in and of itself, there is no guarantee that a circular economy will be a socially just economy. And so what we risk is that as we make this move and as this topic gains more traction, that the people who benefit from the transition are the people who have primarily always benefited from and disproportionately benefited from our current linear system. So this is really key to make this integration in everything that we do, everything that we're designing, every strategy that we implement to ask, how is this affecting people? How is it affecting people in our locality, within our national borders, but also what are the longer term kind of feedback loops across borders? Um, and I think this was one of the key kind of criticisms that came from a lot of civil uh, society groups when the EU strategy was launched uh, back in March 2022. A lot of people asking, where is the human rights kind of perspective on this EU strategy? Um, and what was kind of a key moment in, in my year was the announcement that happened at the Global Fashion Summit, actually, um, where the OR Foundation announced the partnership with Shein and that there was going to be a $15 million fund over the next three years uh, from Shein to really um, fund the development of the circular system in the Cantamanto market in Accra. And it's kind of a sign of the times, I suppose, that these voluntary-led um, or brand-led voluntary EPR schemes are maybe coming in where regulation doesn't uh, in this moment. And, you know, that fund is going to directly uh, really be distributed in, you know, in uh, Cantamanto to, in one hand, kind of 
help those who are in vulnerable uh, positions and jobs transition out of those vulnerable positions and jobs, but also really empower the people on the ground who are dealing with that waste every day to build up the infrastructure and the system on, on the ground in a uh, counter market, market to, uh, to manage it themselves. So this is just a hint, I suppose, of the kind of conversation that is evolving at the intersection of the circular economy and society and social justice. Absolutely. And, and like you were saying earlier, um, when we were upstairs, it's bridging the gap, isn't it? Because policy is sort of slower, takes longer to come through. And brands, if they're really good, if they're really on the front foot, can actually do very positive things quickly. And this is what we need because it's not going to be automatically about developing um, society, culture, people's needs, equity. Circularity could just stay with the big companies if we're not careful. This is a, such a big opportunity for a very different kind of industry. And it's a little bit of an uncomfortable space because we are advocating for the circular economy, but we have to advocate for a just circular economy. So, you know, it's kind of, in a way, keeping that critical lens on everything that we do and make sure that we don't perpetuate the same mistakes that we're trying to get out of. Exactly. Great. So, that was our three themes. And now we're going to hear from what the guys in New York have to say about their year in circular textiles. Yes. Hi. Thanks, Becky. That was wonderful. Excellent to hear the three themes that you have. Um, at Blenzig in the past year, I would say what we've really seen with Revibra is an increase in specific market segments picking up. So in the home segment, we have some towels that are coming to the market. And then also in the intimate apparel area, we've seen that um, intimate apparel producers are looking for easy solutions around circularity. So I see those two markets really developing. And just to pick up on what you were saying, Becky, you know, really, there's no time to waste. And so we have to look at how we can continue to scale. And I'd like to have some of our other uh, participants here explain what they're working on. So I'll start with you, Carla. Great. Um, at Accelerating Circularity, what we did is we looked at what was capable, what was possible in the United States. We mapped that, and now we're actually piloting, I think, earlier. I think it was um, mentioned that we need to pilot these things. So we're piloting from collecting sorting through the recycling process into yarn spinning, and we are doing that um, at production-based scale. So we think that that's really exciting. We're doing that with recycled cotton, um, recycled polyester, fibra in Jersey, knits, denim, um, and also towels. Great. Dina? Yeah. So, so at Mara Hoffman, for us, we continue to really focus on the design side, looking at, you know, model materials and increasing our fiber to fiber uh, recycling style. So for us, that looks like 100% recycled cotton denim that we launched. We also work with 100% recycled wool and cashmere in the collection. Um, and increasing our take back programs and continuing to push our full circle program, which is our peer to peer resale platform. That's an on, great. Yeah, um, Kitchen from Sheehan, uh, you already gave a little bit of an introduction of our $50 million EPR fund that we established earlier this year to help mitigate textile waste and to fund solutions in the circular space. Um, also, working with partners like Lansing and others to uh, accelerate our uptake of circular materials. And uh, we also will be launching a, an exciting peer-to-peer -peer, uh, circularity service off our app from later on this month. So stay tuned. Great. Katie? Um, I think this year for our Builders, builders, the, uh, the, the big thing for us is the implementation of investments that we've been making along the way. Uh, we were actually able to give a higher capacity and make a bigger effect in the fiber concentration. We just launched Circular Park, which is a clean energy uh, driven facility, right, for the recycling plant, which has enabled us to put in uh, 500,000 kgs of recycled fibers, made those consumer elements, into our fabrics, as well as because it's clean energy driven. We have artistic energy, which we've been able to. We have new partners now this year, like we have energy for solar, um, and also we've got that too. And there are many lots of wind, uh, wind energy within the country with our system. So those are kind of our biggest. It's all interconnected. Well said. Oh, yeah, I'm Alexina from Sorflyer. 
and particular sort that is that we develop technology for the sorting and management of based on waste. And what we aim to do is to empower the current infrastructure of collectors and sorters to project directly, to become the needed feedstock suppliers for recycling. So we're so far we've already been working here in the US with a couple of clients that they've been doing sorting and preparing this feedstock for recycling. We have partnered for some of the trials with a services ID that has been going great. So yeah, we we aim to leverage on the data at the same time that we collect to increase the traceability and transparency as well as the sorting uh, solutions for these companies and the industry. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm super excited to be uh, having helped a lot of companies, a lot of startups this year that um, I've been working on uh, um, solutions for uh, to accelerate this circularity. And uh, I think an important point here, um, I mean, one of these uh, is within the ledger space that has not been, has not been discussed, but the ledger alternative, uh, alternatives and how those can actually come from waste, uh, biomass. Um, but it's great to see how uh, all the learnings from these past two years are also coming together uh, into educational pieces because there's a lot, there's been a lot of launches and I'm happy to be helping the MIT, uh, to have been helping the MIT lately on uh, preparing for launches of uh, a few programs that you hear about with it, um, the circularity in the in where um, that will be a consortium that will probably be launched um, at the beginning of next year. Um, at the MIT, as well as um, something more uh, holistic that will probably cover the whole spectrum of innovation to, to advance, of course, sustainability and, and circularity skill at the MIT, open to all the brands to, um, to really gather together in a free competitive space to, um, to advance this and implement this innovation that are existing in this kind of ecosystem. Sure. Hi, um, for the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, we really work consistently on waste issues and influencing legislators. Um, also, currently working on a new project to create a repository of legislation around circularity in textiles um, and support the circular textile development by setting up the conditions to create public private partnerships and the political world to create circular textile um, innovation, a, a circular textile innovation industry in New York City, in New York State, from our, our post-consumer apparel and textile waste. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, at the Interdy brand in New York City here, we are very excited and getting ready to launch our Take Back Repair Resale program. It's going to be called Second Wave, and we're all very excited about it. So that's a big event for 2023 and then we're also just really focusing on materials on our uh, preferred materials trying to increase organic recycled and uh, hopefully regenerative um, so at DRAN we've been now piloting in our in the scaling phase of uh, using our technology and our allocation engine to reverse materials and textile not only waste, but herbs that can be reused and sort them to the highest value. So we've been using the product identifiers that are in some of the garments already and other point of sale tags and tagging systems um, to really support brands in their take back programs, but not only that and also in the recycling. That's really important for some of the textiles that, that can't have another life as is. Great, so that wraps it up on some of the activities that we're working on on this side of the ocean um, that are covering the products and services, materials, and people in society. So I'll pass it back over to you. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing everything from North America. I'm sure that was just a snapshot, but really good to get people's views and what's happening. Uh, so, I'm going to introduce the next phase here in the next section of the program, which is around our circular progress updates. Um, so, since World Circular Textile Day launched in 2020 through to 2050, every year we're asking signatories three questions. What has been your biggest accomplishment towards full circularity over the past year? Your biggest challenge? 
and what do you need from the industry? And our aim with these probing questions are to capture a snapshot of where the progress is today so that in a year's time we can look back and see how far we've come, like we're doing today. It's also about acknowledging and celebrating the wins. That's what World Circular Textiles Day is all about, really taking a positive approach here. And also to get a sense of the pinch points, where are the challenges, because as we overcome old challenges with circularity, new ones are going to step in. So this year, we had over 45 circular progress updates from across the network, from around the world, in, in the form of recorded interviews, as well as written submissions. And we've got a clip on this, but before we go into that, I wanted to just pull out a couple of submissions that came in in writing uh, from a few of the signatories, just to give you an idea of the scope of, of progress. Um, so Eric's Blue Matters in Turkey uh, opened their post-consumer textile recycling and water recycling plant. Infinite X has launched the first circular fashion platform in India uh, with 360 degree circularity services, making the adoption of circular practices easier for brands and manufacturers. Panther Denim, uh, also tap foam textile, and it's a fabric mill in China where they, from their perspective, are encouraging buyers to take up more recycled cotton, more recycled polyester and biodegradable fabrics. They're also working on improving the durability of fabrics. What was interesting that they, they are noting as a fabric mill that they have limited influence uh, in their activities. They can't be very effective in really pushing this shift. They believe that the you know, business and lifestyle and culture has to be at the forefront of doing this, but they're doing their best from where they're at. In the last 12 months, clothing brand Finisterre has seen demand for repair services increase over 17% versus last year with their Lived and Loved program. They've also partnered with Reskinned, a resale platform, and another WCT signatory uh, earlier this year where they are, it's their second phase of their take back program. And we had an update from Fashion for Good in the Netherlands. It was so long that we need another program to cover it all. Uh, but it was across materials, recruiting new innovators, textile sorting, textile tracers. It was a really good sign of the times, all of the progress that's happening. And that they're kind of at the heart of facilitating this type of change. And uh, a big celebratory note out to them. They celebrated their five-year birthday this year, which was good to see. So those are just a few uh, of the written submissions. I had the privilege of interviewing uh, a couple of our signatories via Zoom, and up next is a clip that captures just a few highlights. Recycled textiles for the last 15 years and in the last one year, especially after COVID, while all this time we were working on trying to take care of all the challenges that a brand met, whether it was color, consistency of blend, consistency of uh, quality, consistency of chemical compliance, consistent scale. And then on the other side, compliances as to social compliances, environmental compliances, and uh, you know the uh, doing things at scale. Today we are presenting the denim collection only with recycled articles. We don't have any more 100% cotton articles that are not sustainable. 
So that's the, the biggest change that we decided. It's a big risk because a lot of customers do not believe in recycle as much as they do maybe with organic or with they do with a cotton 100% coming from America, Australia, or wherever. I don't want to put any, any country in concrete. So the thing is that we decided that Royal presence today, the winter 23, 24, only articles that have a minimum of 30% recycled content. And that's the the big the big thing that we are doing that is take, most probably we will lose orders, but we don't care. Because at the end, by 2025, all of our collection will be, uh, maybe if, not, if it's not 100% recycled, will be a big majority, minimum 60 to 70% recycled content in all the articles. In the past year, we were able to onboard many of the top luxury designers who previously had no um, way to um, dispose of their waste apart from incinerating it or um, throwing it into landfill. So we're now able to resell it for them um, and find it a second home. It's been a great year for us. Our biggest achievement by far is our latest round of investment, our Series B, which was led by uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures. But also what is so exciting about that is that we had new investors joining them, uh, Temasek from Singapore, as well as industry leadership from uh, Inditex and Milliken and another uh, financial powerhouse uh, there in London, Lansdowne Partners. And so we're really excited. These are great investors who are bringing far more than capital, a lot of expertise in scaling hard tech, which is required for molecular recycling. And we're uh, embarking on this next chapter with some really strong partners. We've had some big new brands join on uh, within the Canopy Style Initiative or our Pack for Good uh, initiatives so focused either on the Disco supply chain or the paper packaging uh, supply chain. So brands like Xi'an um, in the food and beverage area. Um, ben and Jerry's most notably uh, recently, but many, many others uh, that have come in um, really excited, not only about shifting out of high carbon, high biodiversity value forests, but the fact that circular economy next gen solutions are their pathway uh, away from high carbon, risky uh, supply chains. In the last year, we've uh, opened uh, five stores uh, a couple of them that we're really proud of, we're all proud of them all, but um, in terms of fashion sort of prominence, uh, we opened a store on Argyle Street. So if you look out uh, the door, there's the entrance to the Oxford Street Station. You look to your right is the iconic Liberties. But for us to plant the flag of reuse, the flag of vintage, the flag of uh, a second hand on Oxford and Regent Street, it's just a, it's a good moment for a success about what circularity can look like. The biggest challenge which I feel sitting here in India is that while we are working very hard to overcome and meet the brand expectations and sometimes we feel that we are not able to present it to the decision maker so this is a very important uh, uh, area where on one hand the commitments are there but the connect is yet to be made between the recycler, between the garment manufacturer and the deciding person on the brand. The biggest challenge is, is technology. Is technology. Why? Because the industry has been working more or less, and please understand me, in the same way for the last 2000 years. And now we suddenly are saying that we need to change everything. And we don't need to use the standard cotton, we need to use recycled cotton. We need to die without, we need to die indigo without water. We need to wash without water. We need to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all those things, the technology didn't move this fast because once you are in your comfort zone, it takes time to change. We are able to produce apparel grade yarns and fabrics using 100% post-consumer recycled textiles. So the biggest challenges for that is, of course, convincing the brands to accept 100% uh, 
post-consumer recycled textiles because what I see right now, the brands are focusing more on the cons rather than the pros. And, you know, there's too many questions and too many uh, what ifs rather than why nots. I would say one of the big gaps that we see is uh, the scale of investment and the uh, the scale of investment that is willing to step in and write the size of checks that are needed uh, to actually um, build the commercial scale infrastructure. So I would really uh, advocate for a, a global extended producer responsibility system uh, whereby we can somehow look into if, 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 if um, items, if garments are not made for recycling, which is most of them, um, then there should be some sort of weight tax, waste uh, tax added to the product that goes into the uh, solving this end-of-life uh, challenge. A very, very strong willpower that we need to make it happen rather than a lot of talk, talk, talk. We need more walk, walk, walk. If the brand doesn't create, design a garment that is circu circularity-minded, I don't know if that word exists, if they don't do the garment thinking already in the circularity, all this doesn't help. Because if I make the most sustainable fabric or the most circular fabric in the market, but at the end you make a garment that is going to have 20 rivets, three zippers, uh, I don't know, printed in colors that cannot be reused, etc., etc., that garment is going to go to the garbage. Everybody knows today what it needs to fast track. It is more about connecting to the recyclers. It is more about connecting to the garments. And to my mind, it is more about a very, very honest commitment to the cause than a superficial commitment. Be more collaborative, I guess, is um, I think something that we should all do. Sharing information and um, and spend time absorbing the information and learnings that are out there. Our ask would be, number one is to include reuse and resale in your offering and, and, and be brave about that because that's the, that's the fastest route to a low in carbon footprint. Secondly is challenge your merchandisers, not the designers, because we already have them on side. Challenge the merchandisers to actually look at the cost accountings for projects through a lens of longevity. The one thing that could really change the game here is that even though a lot of these materials are new, they're nascent, it's nascent in the way that 10 years ago, solar power and wind power was nascent. And it was uh, available in lesser volumes. Sometimes it had a premium. Um, and now, guess what? Solar and wind power is cheaper than coal and oil. And that's what's going to happen when you scale up next gen. It becomes cheaper with economy of scale and with refinements in the technology that happen when people are producing. I think uh, we've felt specifically in the last 12 to 18 months that the industry is really beginning to take circularity much more seriously. And I think what's important is that the industry continue to signal to the investment community that this is a problem that they want to solve. And there's several ways they can do that. Um, certainly doing uh, well-publicized releases of capsules is a great start, but investing uh, as well as offtakes, meaning uh, commitments, contracts to purchase circular items when they're available are really key for technologies like ours to scale. Last words from Sir there. Um, in New York, I'm very conscious of the fact that we have gone extremely over. Um, and you guys have busy lives. If you want to step out, please feel free to do that. If you have any final words, uh, 
let us know now. Um, are you, if you're happy to stay, please do. How do you feel? <laughs> stay or no? We'll leave it to you and raise your hand if you want to say hello. We've also got Martin Boshin, who we're going to cut to now, who tried to get to London this morning but forgot his passport, so we have to make him feel a bit guilty. Um, do we have Martin? <laughs> Can we hear Martin? Can we see Martin? Not yet. Or maybe we won't. Eddie, do we have Martin coming in? If not, we can move on. I think one of the things I was going to round up there on the circular progress updates, um, when it came to challenges that didn't get captured here, and we heard a really big call out for more investment. Uh, collaboration came up a couple times. Of course, we need that in circularity. And then the one thing, again and again, is infrastructure sorting and pre-processing for post-consumer textiles. Um, on the topic of pricing for sorted textiles, Hans Bahn from Vila Textiles in the Netherlands, who's been advancing the fiber sort and trim clean system there, says markets need to grow and companies need to pay circular prices for circular products. And on that note, I was going to come to Mark, but I'm not sure if we have him. So I think we can move on. We're running short on time, so I might pull Becky back up. The circular progress updates, the interviews that you saw, the written ones, they will all be on the WCT website in the coming days, and we'll be sharing them on social media. I highly recommend you go back and see them in full. Those are just snapshots. You'll get a chance to hear about Stephen Bethel from Bank and Vogue, Bank and Vogue talking about being vegetable dependent, um, which was an interesting diversion. And also you get a chance to see his ridiculously large hat again, um, but very stylish. And the back is going to hand over to you for our cultural movement section. And conscious that we're running over here, so we're whizzing on through it. You're, you're fine to slip away, don't mind. Um, God, we thought this was going to be the seamless technical show, didn't we? It makes the one we did in my office and not look so bad, doesn't it? <laughs> Last year. Anyway. We've got a final section for you now, which is about creating a cultural movement. Because it's not just about uh, industry, it's not just about technology, it's about what this means to people, how people can be involved, how we can be talking about it more, and how we can kind of be understanding it in a more holistic way. Because if your head is like mine, I'm full at the moment of all of those different bits of information, and all of those parts of the supply chain that need to connect up let alone the scale of the money, the scale of the investment, the scale of the activities. You know, so what we're trying to do now is, is think about how do we keep this sort of surfaced? How do we turn up the volume? How do we get people excited and interested? Um, and we'd like to come to you guys and hear from you in, in just a second. Um, but we did ask some of our um, signatories about creating a cultural movement. And in the next few minutes, what we're going to do is, uh, is just get you to think about What's needed? What is need? What do we need to happen so that people are more connected? They're talking about this, and there's a buzz and an excitement. I'm aware we're watching a lot of films, but there is an online audience as well. So this is, I think, the last film now, and it's the comments about creating a cultural movement. Thanks for staying around, New York. It all begins from the brands and the retailers. Today, if the consumer, the average Joe on the street doesn't know anything about circularity, and it is not manufacturers like you and me who can educate the consumers. It is the brands and retailers who have consumer-facing 
uh, advertising and consumer facing coverages that can tell them what circularity is and by actually putting stuff on the shelves and telling them this is what circularity is will the consumers actually know what it is and accept it or reject it i think consumers are still just beginning to understand how their clothing is made where it comes from what's the impact uh, after its use and we need to continue to educate them to really make this more central in our culture or to create a culture around circularity i also think um governments have a role to play in this um i think it's a very tough industry in the sense that it's 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 not concentrated you don't have three or four players that control 95% of the market and so it's really hard to be first to adopt new change and and this is a a perfect opportunity where where smart regulation can create a level playing field uh that will help seed a culture around circularity 2 months ago i sat down with courtney kardashian cuz she's doing a uh, a line with boohoo and she wants to make a quote you know a sustainable um collection so they brought in five industry experts we were one of the industry experts but to sit down with somebody who who has a really big tent like a, a kardashian and for them to even be interested in our space and then for them to even you know let us into the room to say okay well, what does good look like it's like you know we're no longer talking about the fringes of of uh, or the 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 guy the people like yourself that have lead it led a charge for so many years in in a time is probably very much alone and really tough but then all of a sudden when you have a kardashian around the table um you look around and say wait a minute this is this is a changed environment <laughs> we need to make circularity less geeky and more sexy which i think it inherently is solutions are sexy i always look to what's happened in other spaces uh and uh like the plastics campaign where now everybody knows that we need to get off of uh plastics and how damaging it is sometimes uh it's a, a moment where it, it just kind of lands with uh, as a cultural piece and i think that uh circularity is moving in that direction it's got that kind of um feeling in the air right now there people are concerned and they know that the fashion industry has something to do with the problems that we're experiencing and climate change is real it's been super hot in europe and floods in pakistan and fires uh in in uh uh California and people are starting to recognize that there are generators there's reasons behind these changes um and something needs to be done and i think we're on the verge of that moment when uh the responsibility to become a circular economy is going to emerge as a must amongst uh, people who you wouldn't have thought before would be talking about it so i i think we're almost there it's becoming part of our cultural zeitgeist. Okay, great comments. And um I did read a report though that very few people really understand what surf economy is and and certainly surf and textiles. So there's a real gap and um, we do need to keep sort of thinking about how to how to how clear conversations about this. But has anybody got any put your hand up if you've got a thought about what's needed to
in Ireland around different topics, more to do with, you know, well, the big movements we've had recently around gay rights or abortion or whatever it is. But I always, one of the kind of key um, questions that comes up is, um, like, tell your granny, you know? Like, how do we get this to a point where it's a topic of conversation around the dinner table? There's a piece of research that was just published recently in Ireland that said only um, only one in four people in Ireland have ever even heard of the term circular economy, let alone know what the hell the term means, you know? So like how do we bring it down to that community level? It shouldn't be that you can only engage in this topic when you're buying something off a shop shelf, you know? So I think this is a really, really interesting and valid point in how we support those community initiatives more. Hi, I'm Tanya Lewis, I'm founder of Cycon Circular Concierge, which helps um, users manage their wardrobe around life cycles, such as care, repair, and resell, donation, recycling, all in one app. It's basically one solution. Um, I have a question actually uh, for one in four people um, who know, right, what circular economy is. Um, I I'm wondering if sort of one, one out of four, or has there been any study done on understanding how frustrated people are about any tools available to help them be more sustainable with their wardrobes, you know, household. Because um, we've done research which says, you know what, there's so many tools, there's so much information out there, and um, we just don't know where to start or how to choose the best tool out there. Um, maybe you could sort of mention, of, you know, where, where people are at emotionally and, you know, how, how do they navigate this whole complex world of tools right now? Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question because, you know, we're, we're seeing so much activity in knowledge of in materials, textiles, fashion production, shipping, return, but actually, you know, what does this mean to the average person? And I think that's a big piece of research that's been missing in the last few years. Really happy about the RAP report that's come out today, Citizen Insights. So that starts to break down garment by garment what people's sort of activities are and, and sort of sense of what they were prepared to do. How prepared are they to mend it? Whether or not that's something they would rent, you know, and, and how much might they sort of spend? And, and, and you know, that we need a lot more research like that. Getting granularity there. Um, and then I think emotional durability, emotional attachment, fashion psychology. This is the next, again, this is another black tip for you fashion psychology. There was, a, there was a book launch here, wasn't there, a couple of weeks ago by a, a new uh, author who's looking at our relationship to clothes in terms of our emotional attachment. And I think that the RAP report shows that clothes don't get thrown out or passed on or remain unworn because they've worn out or they've got damage in them. It's because we fall out of love with them or we change our sense of who we are. And so a huge amount of buying and then not wearing and then wasteful behaviour that's right behind this bit of the supply chain, which is where we're trying to tidy it up and take care of it and do better. That bit is really underexplored. And that means we've got to work with psychologists, anthropologists, we've got to do longitudinal studies, we really need to get very inside the heads of people. Because on the one hand, you can come at it from behaviour change, messaging, education. Think about that amazing campaign uh, by Fashion Revolution and, and Lucy from Putera, who's here. You know, they did such amazing work to get messages out there about who made our clothes. But at the end of the day, I mean, I live with young teenagers. They just want to look different. They want new stuff. They want their friends to go out. You know, it's. We've got to really start to sort of design services and flows to meet those sorts of needs. And, and, and just, yeah, I mean, it's all kinds of things need to sort of connect up. Do you guys want to say any last thoughts about that? Well, just, it, it struck me, I was reading a report recently by The Real Real um, in the US, and they were reporting that every single day there's 20,000 second-hand items being added to their site. So kind of the sense of kind of newness and the thrill of the hunt, like all of those things that drive consumption, hyper-consumption in the linear economy, technology is now allowing us to kind of 
fulfill perhaps those same needs, but through circular, um, you know, circular offerings. But I suppose the bigger question is, do we want to still perpetuate that healing in people? It's great that we can answer the need now through a second life and just facing a first-hand item, but the bigger underlying chasm, you know, the hole that we're trying to fill through through clothing, I think that is the elephant in the room of them. You should have seen the WhatsApp chat between the three of us like, what are you wearing? What are you wearing? Should we coordinate on colours or not? Right, one last word about uh, a cultural movement. Wake up, New York. Hello, Trisha. Hello, New York. Oh my God, this is so strange. <laughs> 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 just leave them to it. Come on, you're going for a drink in a minute. Are you coming? Um, we're going to leave that then. Okay, um, we're at the end now. So it's time for final words and um, to sort of send some messages for 2023. Some hopes, some messages. And then um, Cindy's put her credit card behind the bar. So there you go. And if you're online, sorry. What have you got to say, Cindy, about next year? That's the final message. Let's get to the bar. Um, New York City, sorry sorry about the sound and the tech issues. I think I'm really, really enthused about all the developments, all the new businesses that are coming out, all the scale, all the investment. We need to work harder, quicker, and faster. And it's great to see the enthusiasm in this room and the patience in this room. So thank you all for coming out. Let's carry on the conversation with drinks, um, and however long you can stay, let's, let's keep talking. Thank you, everybody. Um, Gwen, any last thoughts? No. no. All right. <laughs> um, one last thing. Thank you, Cindy, for dedicating your life, your career, your year, year on year, for pushing this forward and doing all this work. It's amazing. And um, the more we get together, the more we talk, the better, the better the future can be. So thanks, everybody. And uh, see you next year.